I'm Sarah Wilson and you're listening to the Roots and All podcast. I'm here to help you get growing. Join me as I explore everything plant related both indoors and out and provide the information you need to create your perfect green environment. Hello and welcome to this week's episode of the podcast. This week I'm speaking to Joff Kurtois, conservationist, ecologist and founder of Slow Motion Distillery. Saturday Just Gone saw the launch of National Hedgerow Day, an annual event launched by Joff to inspire people to undertake their own foraging missions to spot what's growing and living in their local hedgerows. Hedgerows are historically important, biodiverse and fascinating, as Joff explains. Here's Joff introducing himself and his business. Well, I am the founder of uh, Slow Motion Distillery, um, started way back in 2002. Um, and the business start, I'm a, I'm an ecologist by training, um, used to work for the RSPB for many years and studied, uh, ecology at university, but I started trying to help a farmer improve his land, his farm for wildlife. Uh, and so we started doing lots of conservation measures all over the farm. One of the things that we did was stopped cutting the hedgerows annually, which we've done in the past, to try and allow the hedges to grow out and produce more fruit. Fruit will only grow on second year growth uh, of, uh, of shrubs. So um, by cutting the hedges every year, you get very little fruit production. So we put the, the hedges into a three year cutting rotation. And as a result, had lots of fruit occurring all over the farm. And in particular, on this particular farm, lots of sloes started appearing. So whilst there were lots of hawthorn berries and blackberries and other fruit available for the wildlife, sloes are rarely eaten by anything else. So we thought, well, actually, we could start harvesting that as a crop. Uh, and that would fund and make some sloe gin and sell that. And that would fund the conservation work on the farm. So it was genuinely, the business came about as a complete sort of surprise uh, reaction to uh, some conservation work that we were doing. Mm, that's interesting. Um, so if you cut them in a three-year rotation, does that have any effect at all on their health or their growth? So it, inevitably it does. And it can be at times, if they're particularly growing quite uh, um, quite uh, aggressively, it can, you know, the cutting back can be quite aggressive. But ultimately it aids the health of the hedge uh, overall so you know and, and you cut it in rotation so you don't cut all the hedges on the farm in one year you cut a third of them or a fourth of them you know whichever whichever it is uh and you and we let we left a lot of hedges to grow even more than that so sometimes they went to a much longer rotation but as long as you're sensitive with the management you can uh, you can you can manage that pretty well and this may be it may sound like a very simple question but i suspect it's it's a bit more complex <laughs> but what is a hedgerow <laughs> well, that, that you know, depends on how long how long do you want the answer to be? I mean, uh, uh, hedgerows. You know, uh, I mean, you you really struck on the, an, an area of interest in mine, the social history of hedgerows, uh, because the hedgerows are utterly man made. They are composed of natural things, plants, inevitably. Um, but you know, hedgerows. You know, you don't see hedgerows really anywhere else uh, in the world. That you know, hedgerows here are uh, you know a truly man made thing. And if you went back to the 15th 16th 17th century um you know hedgerows were seen uh, as uh, you know inc were incredibly divisive um you know they were they were there during for the enclosures act so when landlords started taking the land back from us peasants you know they divided the countryside up in and, and own and began to own the land for the first time and they the way they demarked their ownership was often using hedgerows so um, if you talk to victorian ladies who love going out and painting landscapes they would say that these lines of plants that were obviously man-made were ruining the landscape and uh, you know putting a human footprint if you like across the countryside they were unnatural so uh, if you talk to those people back then and, and you talk to the peasants whose land had been taken away from them, um, they were really divisive. But of course, we now, in, with, you know, as agriculture intensified and wildlife became less prevalent across the countryside, hedgerows started to become incredibly important um, as, uh, as uh, channels, if you like, uh, um, for, for wildlife. So, you know, the views of what hedgerows are as, uh, you know, or, or what they're like has uh, changed over the centuries. And now we, we value them highly and we wouldn't, you know, we, 
we indeed as as when Hedra started to be taken out in the 70s and 80s um and started to remove there were lots of campaigns you know about the removal of hedgerows which which would be ironic in history terms so a hedgerow is really a composed of shrubs and plants fast growing shrubs and plants generally with thorns that keep us out and animals in and the reason that farmers and landlords used principally hawthorn which produced those really bright red berries that you see uh, um, at this time of the year hawthorn uh, shrubs and blackthorn uh, which produce sloes so those principally were the two plants that were were used to, uh, to make up hedgerows um, both of which you can take cuttings and 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 very simply propagate through cuttings so quite cheap to use uh, and they're both quite quick growing species so you know the hedges um, would grow up quickly of course you now see and particularly on parish boundaries you see a lot more variety of hedges and the best hedgerows for wildlife are the ones that have got lots of varieties so i've got a maybe witch elm hazel I've even seen oak, um, you know, lots of uh, dogwood, lots of other plants in there too. So the ones that are the best for wildlife are the ones with the most variety. That was a long answer to a that was a long answer to a short question. Sorry, my apologies about that. I did suspect it might be not quite as simple as it seemed on the face of it. Um, but interestingly, yeah. given that they are a man-made construct, what makes them yeah. such biodiverse entities? Is it just that they acted yeah. as a refuge at some yeah. point? Yeah, well, I think, you know, as, as, I'm, as I intimated, one of the things that has happened in the countryside, you know, if you, if you, if you go to the, the state, I mean, the reason I'm interested in farming as well as conservation is because in the UK, you have to, be, you have to understand farming if you're interested in wildlife, because there is pretty much no wilderness, even at the top of the mount, you know, the highest mountains in, in, uh, in the UK, you will see sheep grazing. Basically, everywhere is affected by farmers it isn't under concrete really and what's happened in the countryside has been well documented over the last 60 or 70 years since the war we we asked farmers to increase food production which they've done very efficiently Um, but that has come that efficiency of production of manufacturing of food in our countryside has come at the expense of wildlife because the the efficiency basically has made food less available to wildlife and more available to us principally so hedgerows as natural phenomena around the outside of far of fields that aren't really farmed therefore they're left to grow up and and, and, uh, and you know kind of they, they become um harbors for, for wildlife and because they have fruit in there and lots of variety they can support lots of a variety of wildlife so they've become increasingly important as a wildlife refuge over the last 40 or 50 years and yes you know as i said they're full of if you've got lots of different plants you'll have lots of different insects and you may have lots of different fruits all of which you know provide habitats and food for, for wildlife and yeah they they provide cover um, I mean, it's a pretty common sight for us to see a sparrow hawk dashing down at one side of a hedgerow and all the little brown birds, the sparrows and so on, dashing for cover into the uh, into the hedgerow where the sparrow hawk can't get. You mentioned that um, people selected fast growing species for their hedgerows. Mm, mm. Did they also select them because they thought they could be used by humans for foraging? I suspect absolutely not. Um so uh, you know one of the uh, one of the reasons so I, uh, i'm afraid i have a long answer for this one as well i mean i don't so they, they selected those plants because they were fast growing and because they had thorns which would keep animals in uh, i'm possibly uh, being slightly unfair when i say i'm keeping to keep people out but that was possibly a reason as well you know if you ever come across a blackthorn hedge you really want to walk around it if you possibly can not go through it so um you know they are very spiky but uh, and, and what that's the so i don't think they were planted with a reason to encourage foraging but because um you know one of the reasons that um you know we started making slow gin that was how how we got into business as i said earlier on you know the prevalence of slows on a hedgerow on the hedgerows on the farm where we were based uh, made us think about making slow gin and selling slow gin to fund the conservation work we've we've gone on to make lots of other things and gin itself uh now but um one of the the uh, things about slow gin for people who, who live in the countryside is often a sort of right feeling of a rite of passage when you know to country life as it were when you make slow gin you go out and you you forage for slows and then you go back and uh, 
steep them in a bit of gin with sugar for a few months and open it at Christmas time. That's a kind of rite of passage into countryside life. And and I think there's a reason for that because of the, the these hedgerows, when they were planted in the 16th and 17th century, they were very divisive. And so the, the people who were upset about the hedgerows could go out and and in effect, steal uh, the, the fruit that was growing on the hedgerow and get it for free because the landlord had taken the land away from them. So this was something they could get back and get for free. And so it became a bit of a, you know, a rite of passage of, uh, you know, let's let's get one over on the landlord. Of course, one of the things about sloes is they look um, they look quite tasty. They look a bit like blueberries, but they taste nothing like blueberries. You generally only taste a raw slow once or twice in your life as they're very very bitter um so you know gathering that fruit became you know we can we can uh, we can get this for free from the from the nasty landlord landlord who's taken our land away from us but actually when you've tasted it what the heck am i going to do with this and of course at that time 16th 17th century gin was becoming a huge fashion when william and mary came across uh, the ocean and uh, and made us all Protestants and uh, and and they brought with them Yeneva, which was a, a Dutch drink, which we kind of turned into what we now call gin. So there was lots of gin being made all over the countryside, and then lots of sloes suddenly appearing all over the countryside. Blackthorn was typically a hedge, a um, a woodland edge plant, so people in the countryside would have known it. But suddenly, with all these hedgerows appearing everywhere, suddenly sloes became prevalent everywhere. And so um, suddenly slow gin became a thing and it became a thing that was a bit rebellious uh, and a way of showing your rebellion of going to get something for free from from the landlord who'd taken your land away. That was another long answer to a short question. My apologies. <laughs> no, it's great. Um, so in terms of using hedgerows for foraging on, a, on mm. a farm that's otherwise presumably used in a productive way, do, yeah. Is it important to do that to kind of give them a value that is above and beyond just a <laughs> conservation tool? Well, yeah, I, I mean, I'm, you know, I think it's you know making anything at home yourself, and I, I think you know, even I, you know, I'm you know, I make gin and I make slow gin and you know, lots of other products. Um, but I'd still say making it yourself. There's something special about that, uh, and and it it always kind of tastes better uh, made when when you've put some effort and time and, and love into a product. So, you know, um, I'm not sure of the the intrinsic value for wildlife of harvesting sloes, I don't think is is uh, is that important, but I think it's good for the soul, <laughs> uh, one's own soul. So yeah, I don't think it particularly helps wildlife. And in some cases you might be competing for, for food with the wildlife. So whatever I'd say, when anyone goes out foraging, I'd always say, don't pick everything, uh, you know, leave some for, for wildlife. Um, as I said at the beginning, sloes aren't really that valuable uh, to the fruit themselves, aren't really that valuable to to most wildlife species um, because of the stone in the centre of the fruit and because of the bitterness. So they often they often do rot on the on the hedge um, if they're not picked. So, um, yeah, but if you're if you're picking elderberries or blackberries, I always think, you know, leave some for the wildlife species. So apart from the berries, is there anything else that we can forage from hedgerows? Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, we, I've talked about the classic berries of blackberries and sloes and and uh, and elderberries, but uh, you know, rose hips are you know good. They are a fruit, a bright orange, sort of um, slightly rugby ball shaped fruit um, of of the dog rose, Rosa canina. Uh, uh, you know, they are a, are a rich source of vitamin C, and rose hip syrup is a is a nice thing to uh, to produce and and use to sweeten uh, things. It's got a nice sort of hibiscus, uh, slightly citrusy flavour. Um, we use nettle leaves in our in our um in our gin uh nettle leaves have um kind of herbally grassy kind of um almost bay like taste um slightly spinachy as well i think um when they're dried um so we often forage for nettles nettles again you know there are lots of nettles out in the countryside which is a good thing because they support a lot of butterflies so a lot of butterflies like peacocks and tortoise shells lay their eggs on nettles so again if you're going to take nettles don't take them all um regardless of that we 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 only ever pick the tops of the nettles which you can do if you're really brave with your bare hands i i do that you do get a bit tingly but the nettle tops in the spring and the late autumn come off quite easily um without doing much stinging um so we use uh, we use nettle leaves um another classic uh, you know is, uh, is elderflower uh, so elderberries this time of the year elderflower in sort of may june time um 
Uh, so they're you know a classic thing to forage uh, with a really kind of um, floral taste with slight apple. I always kind of think they have a slight apple fruit pear like taste as well. So ma- making elderflower cordial is a is a classic thing to do in forage. Well, actually, we made uh, this year, which which genuinely were delicious elderflower fritters. Uh, I think there is a recipe for that on our website, but they were. I didn't want more than two, but they were really interesting flavoured, uh, uh, yeah, kind of fritters. And if you can picture an elderflower, they're um, umbilifer-like, so they've got lots of arms sticking out. So you can pick off a, an elderflower head, and it's effectively a handle to dip into the, uh, to, into the, into the batter. So that was, uh, that was quite an experience and quite a nice thing to do. So elderflowers are a great thing to forage. And you've launched National Hedgerow Day. Um, this yeah. episode is going out just after it, but uh, presumably this is a good time to be going out and foraging from the hedgerows. This, yeah, this is this is the classic time of year. I mean, it's the, the the sort of original harvest time, and there's you know harvest festivals going on. Uh, so it is it is the classic time of the year when nature provides lots of fruit. So um, you know, I mentioned we've mentioned blackberries and and sloes. They're all out there now uh and uh and rose hips uh elderflower obviously back in may june but uh, elderberries right now so this is this is the classic time when um you know there's still a lot of wildlife around as well as uh, as you know forageable goods as it were and you know it's now the heat of the summer has gone uh it's you know i i love this time of year of going out and 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 looking for stuff uh foraging the wildlife that's there. And what sort of birds are we likely to find in hedgerows? Well, um, I mean, the classic hedgerow birds uh, would be something like a yellow hammer. There won't be much singing. You know, singing happens in uh, earlier in the year, but uh, you know that. You know, so you don't. You're not going to hear much a great deal of bird song now. But you know, yellow hammer is a classic, a classic uh, hedgerow bird. Bullfinches too, um, which. Their absolute favourite. So the male bullfinch is really boldly pink with a lovely black head and grey back. Um, so bullfinches and yellow hammers, and then lots of uh, what bird watchers call LBJs, little brown jobs, uh, uh, sort of sparrows, tree sparrows and hedge sparrows. Um, uh, you know, would be uh, would be really common sight. And I mentioned earlier the sparrowhawk, which you know a lot of people um, you know kind of worry about all the little birds, but you know sparrowhawks just an important part of our uh, our wildlife. And uh, yeah, we'll often see um, you know sparrowhawks touring down, uh, flying um, quietly down a hedgerow, kind of uh, looking for food themselves. You mentioned obviously, I think hedgerows have had a bit of a checkered past. Um, they've yeah. kind of come and gone in terms of popularity and in physical mm. presence. Do they still need our help to in terms of preservation? Yeah, I mean, I think you know, the more people are aware, the more people will question things about what you know, um, what happens in the countryside and take an interest. You know, over the last few years and last twenty odd years, government have been trying to help farmers to help manage the hedgerows better. And the, but the more people go out and see the hedgerows and they witness the wildlife, and I think the lockdown has been a really <clears throat> important thing in uh, people's understanding and enjoyment of the countryside. You know, when it's you know life. Life has allowed us to go out there. If you're not working, or if you're furloughed, people have gone out and into the hedgerows and and, and into the countryside, uh, of which hedgerows are a big part. And um, so, uh, you know, awareness of what goes on in the countryside is really important. And you know, developing a love for wildlife is really important for its uh, survival. Because if we all show our interest, the government will respond. If, if people are interested in those things and the government will respond by making sure that those, you know, it's, it's harder to uh, remove hedgerows or damage hedgerows. I mean, one of the, one of the big problems for hedgerows is mismanagement. You know, they, they need management. They do, you know, they ultimately, you know, you know, do need management of some kind and farmers often don't have the time or the money, uh, but also often the inclination to manage hedgerows well. And, and that's, uh, you know, so it's it's important for all of us to understand and, and to help, uh, you know, kind of, uh, kind of help their po- popularity and help their maintenance ultimately. Yeah. Um, and if we wanted to establish a new hedge, I think there are mm. schemes that will offer there, def- there definitely are i mean for for farmers and landowners there are there are there are there are schemes out there that uh, that help 
pay for for um for for planting of hedgerows uh and uh you know and there's lots of advice out there online as well uh, as to how uh how to how to plant them the, the real the real if people are going to plant hedgerows the main thing is you know variety of plants you know Yes, you have it. You your mainstays will be your blackthorn and your hawthorn, but putting a bit of holly or putting a bit of dogwood or or witch elm um, or um, birch, you know the, these um, you know to to add a variety. The more variety of plants there will be, the more variety of fruit, the more variety of insects that will be associated with those plants, the the, the better or the more food for you know for the ecosystem. And if we did plant one, how long realistically, mm. given mm. that we had good conditions, how long roughly would yeah. it take before you could actually forage from it? Yeah, well, that's a, that's a really good question. Well, <clears throat> if you were foraging for nettles, they come pretty quickly, <laughs> as we all know. But if you're looking for for fruit from the from the blackthorn, or you're looking for dog rose, I mean, uh, rose hips will come reasonably quickly in th- probably two or three years. But with slows, uh, it's probably it's probably more like three or four plus so it is a long-term investment you're not going to get much return uh, in the in the in the first few years i'm afraid so yeah uh, like a lot of things in in wildlife that you know you you can uh, you can do these things but it takes uh it's a it's a long-term project hmm. that's not too bad actually i thought no I thought no um, longer. yeah i mean it, it it depends if it's that that's probably with good growing conditions so you know uh, you know you certainly to get a good crop of slows uh yeah to, to make a a, a good amount of slow gin you probably are talking 10 years but uh you know it's 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 probably not much longer than that no so for your national hedgerow day what are you encouraging Mm. people to do so we've we've uh, put together a checklist uh of your common hedgerow sites uh for people to um to tick off and and learn really it's principally you know we're, we're starting pretty small we're we're a fairly small business but with a passionate uh center and interest in hedgerows and you know we're just wanting to i suppose share the love and understanding of those habitats so yes we've got a downloadable form on our website slowmotiondistillery.com uh and uh, it it just shares a bit of information, a bit of background uh, about um, lots of different plant species, uh, lots of different wildlife species, I should say, butterflies, moths and uh, and uh, mammals and so on. Of course, the, the humble hedgehog, um, uh, you know, that, that uh, so people can tick off and learn about what's uh, what's out there and develop a love. And of course, you know. We, you know, wildlife is, you know, an important part of uh, our business and the centre uh, uh, of our business in, in a way. And we get inspiration from those hedgerows. But we are all about, you know, we make a product and we we are trying to sell more products. Uh, and uh, but if you sign up for the um, uh, download, the, uh, the the tick list, uh, you get entered into a prize draw for winning a bottle of our hedgerow gin. Uh, so uh, we would uh, certainly encourage everyone to get involved and and. and get out there and learn and and understand uh what's going on out there as well as um trying a bit of uh slow gin or gin as well um uh, or of course we all have to drink responsibly um but uh yeah this you know it's it's all about um sharing information and and, and enjoyment of hedgerows one thing i will say for people out there um this is one of my taglines that i talk about often when i'm talking to people about hedgerows and particularly slow gin um slows blackthorn are almost um uh, almost entirely pollinated by moths uh, and uh, often moths are a bit divisive and they can be a bit of a pain if they come into your house but they are hugely important uh, in the environment and the unsung heroes of the pollination world all the bees and butterflies always get the plaudits but moths are hugely important and if you love slow gin you have to love moths because without moths there would be no slows so uh, that's uh, that's my uh, parting shot for slows and slow gin that uh, yeah moths are to be encouraged at every opportunity if you want to drink more slow gin <laughs> brilliant so i know it's weird at the moment but are you mm. do you have open days at all are you planning anything for next year we we, we we're doing quite a few uh, virtual tastings and uh, we do a bit of virtual walking down the hedgerows there's quite a few videos and things like of that nature on our website at the moment we aren't doing anything inevitably um but we do a hope to open the distillery back up uh you know hopefully next year to do you know a tour of the distillery come and look at our still come and look at how we make gin um but also you know maybe then come for a tour down our 
the hedgerows um, that surround us here at Green Farm, and uh, and, um, and and you know kind of learn a bit about the uh, the uh, the wildlife that lives there. So not at this moment in time, but do look on our website because there are lots of films, uh, uh, talk, you know, that um, that talk about the hedges and and how we use them. The link to the slow motion website is, of course, in the show notes. If this episode has put you in the mood for slow gin and you don't want to wait until Christmas for your own batch, you can always buy some from the website or find your local stockist. And if you'd like to find out more about hedgerows, I'm reading a great book at the moment called The Natural History of the Hedgerow by John Wright. Thanks to Joff for taking part in the interview and thanks very much to you two for listening. Here's Dr Ian Bedford talking about fruit flies. When little black flies come into our homes and begin flying around a fruit bowl, there'll almost certainly be a common fruit fly that's been attracted to a piece of fruit that's in the initial stages of rotting. Since fruit flies use their powerful olfactory senses to detect and follow the scent of fermentation juices that ooze from overripe fruit and on which they feed. And whilst there, they'll mate and lay eggs which will hatch the following day into little maggots that flourish within the fruit's decaying flesh, rapidly maturing, pupating, and then emerging as another generation of fruit flies in as little as ten days. But as annoying as fruit flies might be in the home, they're actually a natural indicator that it's time to sort out the old fruit and perhaps take it to the compost bin, where the flies' maggots can get on with their invaluable job of recycling. Interestingly, though, the common fruit fly currently has another important role to play, a role that's of great value to us in helping us understand biotic systems and interactions. Since its rapid life cycle, ease of maintenance within a science lab, and the recent unravelling of its complete genome sequence, have enabled it to become one of the world's most widely used organisms within genetic and biological research. And the fact that we share 40% of our genes with the common fruit fly allows it to be used as a genetic model for researching human diseases such as Parkinson's and Alzheimer's, and in the quest to understand the mechanisms of ageing, drug resistance, diabetes and cancer. So the next time fruit flies are being a bit of a nuisance in the home, it's worth sparing a thought for how they're helping us understand and improve on our health and well-being before swatting them with a tea towel. You can download or listen to the podcast direct from the website www.rootsandall.co.uk where you'll also find my blog and a sign-up form for the newsletter which gives you a weekly roundup of content plus the inside scoop on things like upcoming guests. Or you can subscribe wherever you normally get your podcasts. Email me with comments and feedback at podcast at rootsandall.co.uk. Follow me on Twitter, Roots and All, Facebook, Roots and All UK, and Instagram, Roots and All Pod. But please also check out my Patreon, where you can make a one-off donation or take out a monthly subscription to help support my work, because if you like what I do, please help me to continue doing it. Even if you make a one-off donation of a pound, trust me, it all helps, and I will be immensely grateful. So please go to Patreon and search for Roots and All.